All right, so in the last week of at-home learning, we're going to talk about nuclear physics. Um, so after completing these notes, you're going to be able to define some stuff you've already done, mass number, atomic number, and isotopes, uh, apply radioactive decay in nuclear reactions. We're not going to look so much at radioactive decay. You did a lot of that in chemistry. I'm more focused on the nuclear reactions. And then we'll look at the various conservation laws. Okay, so conservation of mass, conservation of charge, conservation of energy, conservation of nucleons, all those different things. So all matter is composed of three uh, fundamental particles, and these are ones that you have definitely heard of before. You have the electron, the proton, and the neutron. Electrons and protons have charge. Electrons are really small. Protons a lot bigger. The neutron and the proton are about the same size, um, and the neutron, of course, has no charge. You'll notice, too, the electron and the proton have the same charge, uh, just the electron's negative and the proton's positive. And that's all stuff we talked about uh, in some previous units. So the proton and the neutron basically have the exact same mass, but they are almost 2,000 times bigger than the electron. So the majority of the mass of an atom is actually focused in its nucleus. And that's really what we're going to focus on today, nuclear physics, right? So this is a beryllium atom. And this is just an example I used. I don't know why I picked this atom, but I guess I found the easiest picture of it on the internet. So you'll notice in the nucleus you have protons, four protons, and five neutrons. Okay, And the electrons are out here on the outer shell of the nucleus. All nuclear physics happens in here. Because we're not really going to be concerned at all about the electrons. Okay, that was a lot more, you know, that had a lot to do with whenever we talked about charge movement, circuits, and all that. But we're really focused on what's going on in the nucleus. And that's the whole idea of nuclear physics. So this particular atom, and most atoms, are generally nucle uh, neutral. So the number of protons will always equal the electrons. But you'll notice the number of neutrons does not equal the number of protons. And that's very common. Uh, and I'm going to show you how you can figure that out. So we're going to talk about some different definitions. A nucleon, that is anything that is in the nucleus. So that would be your protons and neutrons. Then you have the atomic number. That's the number of protons in the element. Then you have the mass number, and that's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay, so the atomic number is the number of protons. You'll find that on the periodic table. The mass number is the number of neutrons plus protons. So if you name a nucleus, this is a hydrogen atom, you put the mass number on the top left, you put the atomic number on the bottom left. And so let's look at sodium here, just as an example. And it has the symbol 23 at the top left and 11 at the bottom left. That means 23, that's the number of neutrons plus protons. And then 11 is the number of protons. And if you look at a sodium atom on a periodic table, you'll notice that you have an 11 here on the top left. That 11 on the periodic table, that is telling you that is, the, that is the number of protons, the atomic number, the number of protons. And then you'll notice that sodium is 22.99 if you look at it on the periodic table. That's because not all um, atoms of sodium have 23 nucleons. Some of them will have 22, maybe even 21, maybe 24. The majority of them, though, must be 23 because the atomic mass number that you see on the periodic table is an average of those. We'll get into that later. But So everything you know, well, number one, the mass number, or you have 11 protons, you have 11 electrons. That's generally true. Protons and electrons will be the same. Mass number is 23. So if you want the number of neutrons, you subtract 23 and 11, and you get 12 neutrons. And this, of course, is a sodium atom. All right, so what are isotopes? So if you look on a periodic table, you'll notice that there are, um, you know, the decimals, you'll be like, what is, like on the last one, 22.99, you'll see it with carbon, 12.01. So isotopes are just the same element, but different mass numbers, okay? And the protons will always be the same. That tells you it's the same element. So this is carbon, all the different ones. Carbon, the majority of carbon is carbon-12, but there is some other carbon that is not carbon-12. Uh, so on this chart, I just gave you the relative abundance. The carbon-12 is the majority, right? Almost 99%. This is natural abundance. <clears throat> you can also make some stuff in labs. And then, but carbon-13 has got quite a bit too. 1% of all carbon is carbon-13. So the isotopes are just different, uh, the same element, but with different mass numbers, different numbers of neutrons, basically. So like this one, all of these have six protons, right? So that'd be six. But the neutrons is different. This one, 11 minus six is five. 12 minus six, six neutrons, seven neutrons, eight neutrons. You get the point. So when you see like 12.01 on the periodic table, that's because... Some, most carbon is carbon-12, but some is carbon-13, and that's why you have 12.01, because it's a weighted average. All right, so now we're going to talk about the strong nuclear force. This is one of the four fundamental forces of nature. Um, you have the gravitational force, 
you have the weak nuclear force, which we're not really going to get into much. You have the electromagnetic force, which we talked about a ton with circuits and electrostatics. Uh, but then you have the strong nuclear force. And the interesting thing about it is it only acts over really, really small distances. So electrically, protons don't want to be in anywhere near each other. But what's interesting, if you get them close enough, you get them within the strong nuclear force range, which is tiny, they actually will come together and fuse and, and make atoms. Um, and then you have neutrons in there, which help hold it all together. Okay, so the nucleus, of course, relies on that strong nuclear force to hold it together. So what happens then if you break apart these atoms, uh, either break them apart or bring them together? And that brings us to mass defect and binding energy. So the interesting thing about nuclear physics is when a nucleus is together, it has a smaller mass than if you take all the nucleons and separate them. So you may be wondering, well, that violates conservation of mass, which would be true if you just thought of it as mass. But mass and energy, uh, as Einstein found, are actually two sides of the same coin. They are the same. You can convert mass to energy through his famous equation E equals mc squared, E being energy, M being mass, and C being the speed of light. Um, and so where does, this ener where does this mass go? Well, it goes into the energy that it takes to actually hold the nucleus together. So... If you take the sum of the mass of the protons, sum of the mass of the neutrons, they are more than the mass of the nucleus whenever they are together. So that energy that holds the nucleus together um, relates to more mass uh, or, or can be set equal to mass. And so the mass of the particles that make up the nucleus is higher than the mass of the particles when they're held together in the nucleus. Uh, and that's known as the mass defect. And that missing mass can be converted to energy and when you convert that to energy, you get a nuclear reaction of some kind. And that's what we're going to look at with the rest of this. So nuclear reactions, um, they look a lot, you know, you probably remember equations like this, you know, balancing chemical equations. But nuclear is pretty much the same thing. So say you bombard a nitrogen atom with alpha particles. You have, an alpha particle is basically just a helium atom. But you you have to conserve the total number in all nuclear reactions, the total nucleon number is conserved. So 14 plus 4. Remember, the nucleon number is the mass number, so the top part of this. So 4 plus 14 is 18. On the other side, after the reaction, or whatever you want to call it, 1 plus 17 is still 18. Over here, 2 plus 7 is 9. 1 plus 8 is 9. This, of course, is the charge. The atomic number is also known as the uh, charge number. All right, so let's look at the different nuclear reactions. You might have heard of this before. You did it in chemistry. So fission is whenever you take a very large nucleus and you blast it apart with a neutron. Um, we use uranium-235 in most of our fission reactions for bombs and for nuclear reactors. And uh, so you take a neutron, you slam it into this, and all of these things now take place. You have two different, these are called daughter nuclei, um, and then you get three more neutrons, the three goes in front. But you get three neutrons that shoot out whenever you do these types of, uh, whenever you, fission happens in this manner. And but those neutrons are moving extremely fast, which means they have kinetic energy. And that is the energy. So this added up, the neutrons, this neutron plus the uranium-235 atom, all that added up is, high, is heavier on this left side than it is on the right side. And all that, that missing mass is converted to the energy of these really fast-moving neutrons, and these, these uh, daughter nuclei will also be moving as well. So you get a lot of energy, and this creates a chain reaction, right? So these neutrons will go on to hit more uranium-235 atoms, and, these, and then it just gets more and more and more, and you have a large explosion. This all happens within a very small fraction of a second. Um, and then you have fusion. This is the opposite of fission where you actually have lighter atoms come together to make a heavier atom so you have two isotopes of hydrogen come together to make a helium atom and a fast moving neutron this is actually a lot safer if you could harness it the problem is harnessing it haven't been able to do it yet billions upon billions of dollars has been spent studying nuclear fusion reactions for electricity production and it still has not taken place but if we ever could uh, there's a lot of studies still going on we could, you know, in a way have energy that has no real waste that is bad. There's no gamma rays produced here. Um, you know, you don't have daughter nuclei that are decaying and releasing gamma rays. And, and so it's a really, really neat if we could get this form of energy to work. So fusion, fission, you break apart a heavier atom. Fusion, you bring together 
two smaller atoms to form a heavier atom. And generally that heavier atom is helium uh, and a neutron goes flying off. But you don't get the gamma rays. So we're going to skip radioactivity. There's a whole video on that you'll see later. Uh, so for nuclear reactions, there are three conservation laws that have to be conserved. You have to conserve charge. You have to conserve mass or sorry, nucleons, and you have to conserve mass energy. Remember, mass and energy are used interchangeably when you talk about nuclear physics. So the mass of a parent, if you're talking about fission, um, mass of the parent is greater than the mass of the alpha particle and the mass of the daughter nucleus. If you say you have, this would be uh, alpha emission here, alpha radioactivity. Um, but either way, if you look at how these, all these set up are the same when you have a, a uh, chemical or nuclear reaction. You have an atom that has some number of nucleons at the top, and that number of nucleons has to be conserved, right? 164 plus 4 is 168. Then you have the charge number, or the number of protons, which can also be called the charge number. 75 plus 2 is 77. Um, that missing mass, though, right? So the parent is bigger than the alpha and the daughter. Altogether, that missing mass is released as energy, so you have a moving alpha particle and a moving daughter nucleus. And so they also have to, con so mass and energy are, are interchangeable in this scenario. All right, so let's look at this example problem. You have one ton of TNT releases 4.18 gigajoules. So you need a, a ton of TNT. That's 2,000 pounds. You get 4.18 gigajoules of energy. So how much mass could be converted to energy to release this much energy? So you do the math. E equals mc squared. Gigajoules is times 10 to the ninth. So you do that divided by the speed of light squared. And you get 4.64 times 10 to the negative 8 kilograms. Now, that if we could take mass and convert it directly into energy, it would only take 4.64 times 10 to the negative 8 kilograms. That is that is tiny. That's like a grain of sand. Um, maybe a little bigger. But that is a very, very small amount of mass that is the equivalent of one ton of TNT. So you can see why nuclear reactions are so powerful. All right, and then on example three here, use uh, charge conservation to determine the unknown element in the following nuclear reaction. This is a fission reaction because you have a heavier nucleus that gets broken up into a lighter nucleus. So we want to figure out what this is. Okay, so you add the mass numbers, or yeah, the mass numbers together. So you get 235 plus 1 is 236. And then you do 145 plus 3 is 148. So 236 minus 148 will give you the... Uh, mass number and you do the same thing for charge 57 you don't neutrons don't have any charge you don't know what this is but you know it's 92 so 92 minus 57 will give you the charge number and here's some work here you got to conserve the nucleons so this is what I did 235 plus 1 145 plus X because we don't know what that is so 88 is our unknown nucleon number and 35 when you do 92 minus 57 35 has to be the number of protons look that up on a periodic table 35 protons is bromine, so that is this missing daughter nuclei from the fission reaction. Same thing with fusion, you can do this. You have uh, two different hydrogen, hydrogen isotopes, 2 plus 3 is 5, 1 plus 1 is 2. So whatever's over here cannot have a charge because the charge has already been conserved, so it has to be a single neutron. 2 plus 3 is 5, so we only have 4 here, so we have 1 neutron because the charge is already conserved. And you can look at that there. Okay, so this one you can find the reactant. This is just a decay, this is alpha decay. Same exact thing though, you have a, uh, you have a thorine, so you can look that up, what the charge is, or what the proton number is. That's why it says from table, you can just look it up on a periodic table. It's 90, 90 plus two is 92. That means we have to be looking at uranium as this decay product, right? Because 90 plus 2 is 92. So just find the one that's 92. Uh, and then you can figure out what what the mass number is by adding these together, 231 and 4. So I'll put 235 there. All right. So that is all for this uh, lesson. I hope that you all, you all are doing well. Uh, this will be the first part. This will be the part one of your Nearpod video. So make sure you finish the rest of the Nearpod and uh, do the quiz after the Nearpod. Have a great day.